Hello, and welcome to the Commonweal Policy Podcast. I'm Craig Dale. I'm the Head of Policy and Research at Commonweal. And this week, I'm joined by two guests. Um, I have two, two guests from the Commonweal Energy Working Group. I have Keith Baker and Ian Wright. Hello, both of you. Hello. Hi, Craig. I'll go around both of you just to get a line from introdu- a line of introduction from, from the pair of you. Just uh, Keith, who are you and what do you do? Hi, everyone. Back again. Um, I'm convener of the Energy Working Group. I'm a researcher in fuel poverty and energy policy at Glasgow Caledonian and co-founder of the Energy Poverty Research Initiative. And Ian, it's, this is your first time on the Policy Podcast, I believe. It, it is indeed, Craig. Um, thanks for the invite. Um, my name's Ian Wright. I am retired now, but I worked for about 35 years in the energy industry, uh, both in Scotland and in Ireland, and I have experience of dealing with wind farm developers both as a participant in that and in dealing with the markets that they, they work in. So I have big interest in renewables. Hmm. And that's very lucky for us because that's the topic of this week's uh, podcast. We are talking about the big story from last week, which is this Scotland auction. Scotland is the largest auction of Scottish offshore wind resources so far. Uh, resulting in promises of up to 25 gigawatts of generating capacity built across more than 7,000 square kilometres of Scottish seabed and sea area, split across 17 different sites around the north of Scotland. Proponents have hailed this as as an opportunity to leverage billions of investment um, to, to build this project, as well as uh, £700 million raised in option fees from the auction collected by Crown Estate Scotland and the prospect of somewhere in the region of £30 to £50 million a year in annual rent to Crown Estate Scotland for the, the, for, for the bids. Although the winners of this auction have been almost entirely made up by foreign-owned energy companies, 20% of the capacity uh, of the entire project has been won by the fossil fuel giant Shell and BP alone. However, proponents have promised that Scotland can still benefit from jobs created in the ongoing supply chain. Commonweal produced our response to the Scotland auction last week, and I'll put a link to that report in the description of the podcast. We've called for Scotland to build up our own capacity to ensure that next time uh, there is an auction of this, we have a much greater level of of public-owned involvement uh, within Scotland, up to and including a national energy company. So Keith and Ian... Last week, when the the news of Scotland broke, what were your initial reactions, Keith? Um, I think it's disappointing in that we could be doing so much better. Um, the proponents will say, "Well, this is the situation that we're in now, um, and we need to make the most of it." And it's difficult to argue against that. Um, but uh, you can't ignore the fact that we could be in a much better position. And um, this is something that's been in the planning for over a decade. Um, as you've said, we, you know, we could by now have a public energy company established and we'll talk more about that later. Um, it, it's, it's a massive missed opportunity. Um, and the fact that some of the profits will go to BP and Shell, um, you know, these are not two companies that um, I think we should have involved in our energy future. I actually cut my teeth campaigning against Shell um, for their involvement in the um, execution of Ken Sarawiwa, um, who was campaigning against their developments in Nigeria. So this is a bit personal on that front. Um, but I don't believe for one moment that those two companies, or for that matter, most of the others have any real interest in um, Scotland's future as an independent, democratic, you know, productive country. Um, I'll let Ian do the more technical stuff. <laughs> Well, my first uh, reaction really came from looking at uh, other people's reactions on social media, talking about the uh, this whole resource having been sold out. And I did go and look and see that there was an ongoing payment. So it wasn't just the, the upfront uh, option payment, uh, but there is an ongoing payment by leaseholders based on the output uh, of the wind farms they build. Now, I initially read the uh, the figures because I was wearing the wrong glasses and reading on a small screen. I read it as 1.37 pounds a megawatt hour, but actually it's only 1.07 pounds a megawatt hour. I mean, conventionally I would have uh, taken uh, a, as a rough rule of thumb about three gigawatt hours per megawatt of installed capacity. And sort of looking at it that way, 
um, I, I find that um, absolutely lined up with uh, with your figures, uh, Craig. That it would give about ninety million pounds a year ongoing. When you reverse that uh, calculation, you see that actually it's about three and a half, maybe at a push, um, four and a half thousand pounds per megawatt, which is about the kind of community benefit that a rather unambitious community council would be looking for from an ordinary wind farm developer. So really, we are getting nothing from this. So hugely disappointed at the, um, the lack of ambition, the total um, omission of any mechanism to claw back uh, excess profits if power prices turn out higher. Um, there's clearly the value of these sites have been devalued by the scale of the transmission charges that are levied on wind farms uh, and indeed any generation in the north of Scotland. But I'll leave, uh, I'll leave discussion of that till later, perhaps. Mm, yeah. Um, do you have any comments on, on, on other aspects of that auction process? One of the things that we've been, we've been asked about and we've commented about was that there was a, apparently a, a ceiling on the bid price per, per uh, square kilometre uh, of seabed that people were were trying to get access to and it looks like all of the beds came in at exactly that ceiling despite it having been raised um due to due to a, a previous auction in england having a similar issue of all of the all of the bids capping out has crown estate scotland just severely underestimated the value of scottish wind I think so. Yes, I mean let's rem let's remember that the original price was ten thousand, and it went from ten thousand to a hundred thousand. And as you say, those bids came in. Most of them came in right at the top end. And um, so, yeah, why wasn't that ceiling raised even further? What due diligence? What research did the Scottish government do? Bear in mind they've already had a you know a precedent set by England. You know what work was done to say what is a reasonable level that we should set this to? And clearly, a hundred thousand is way too low. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the whole principle of a cap is quite odd in an auction. I mean, aware that um, in decades gone by, the uh, process for awarding contracts to build non-fossil generation was uh, that people would bid the lowest price and therefore the price to get the uh, lowest level of subsidy from the government. And some people just bid far too low and in the end could not afford to build the projects for the price they bid. So there was under delivery. But in a current situation, to put in a, a cap kind of suggests you think that the companies of the scale that are required to deliver this amount of capacity would be unaware of what it would actually cost to build and might therefore bid too much for the option fee. I mean, that just... It just seems incredible to me. So I, I would say that I can see that there might be an argument for a cap, but I think it's nonsense. Yeah, I mean, the most generous uh, interpretation I've seen about there was someone who suggested that maybe a cap would have helped incentivize smaller companies or community-owned companies even get to, to, to get involved in this. But if you look at the final results, BP is about as far from a small community-owned company as you can imagine. So it clearly it, hasn't worked. It is difficult to see a small community-owned uh, company on its own being able to uh, to ramp up the resources to deliver such a complex project. They would need to have a larger part of, partner. So let's look at the, 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 the scale of this project. We did say that this is the largest auction of Scottish offshore wind um, in, in Scotland's history so far. Um, it's estimated... The, well, the promises that have been made by the, the folk who win the bids total up to just a little under 25 gigawatts of, of energy um, compared to an initial estimate from Crown Estate Scotland of, of 10 gigawatts. How, how does that compare to Scotland's existing generation capacity? What, 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 give us an idea of that, that scale. Well, I would look at it in terms of the, the demand in Scotland. Now, these are historical figures from the days of working uh, solely in Scotland, but um, the total required capacity uh, would have been about seven gigawatts. 
certainly these figures are out of date, but it would be of that order. Um, by the time you start electrifying everything and putting mm. in uh, reserve capacity, you're probably getting up towards, let's be generous and say 15 gigawatts. So between the, uh, the capacity that's being built on shore, the capacity that's being planned for in um, uh, SSE's business plan for the, the current price control period, and this extra 25 gigawatts, you can see that most of the capacity will be to, to provide energy for export. So basically we're using the uh, resources of Scotland to power uh, someone else's economy. We need to be developing our economy um, to use the power that uh, we're producing locally. One question again I got, I got asked um, over the last few days was on that disparity between the, the initial estimate, Crown Estate estimated to be able to, to, to host 10 gigawatts of capacity in this area, but the promises have come in at 25. How were the bidders able to promise so much more? Um, is this again just Crown Estate underestimating the value of, of Scot Scottish resources? I think you have to assume that's the case because um, there are developments in turbine technology happening all the time. It's not static. When I first uh, started in the wind farm development uh, business, we would put up a couple of 800 kilowatt machines and call it wind farm. And nobody would consider building anything with turbines as, with as small capacity as that. So the offshore turbines are massively bigger. They are absolutely huge. Capacities of 12 megawatts and 14 megawatts, um, if not already delivered, are very close to it. So you don't need as many turbines to produce that amount of capacity as you would have in the past. It's all about um, spacing turbines so that the uh, turbulence from one uh, turbine does not affect the power developed by adjacent turbines. So it's, you've got to be clever about the way you lay things out, but that's uh, fairly well understood. And I think uh, the developers who have won options um, have plenty of experience and know what they can produce there. So I wouldn't, mm. uh, I wouldn't say that they were the ones that had made the mistake. Yeah, I mean, this is the, the scale of the turbines themselves is something that fascinates me just from a, an engineering perspective. Uh, and, and it's something that's often not really appreciated about offshore turbines in particular, because we just don't see that scale of structure on land for fairly obvious reasons. Um, but you are talking about structures that are much larger than buildings, wingspan, you know, blade spans of hundreds of metres. Yes. Um, no. Again, Ian, this is, this is probably coming into your specific expertise. Um, what are the implications for the national grid, the, 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 electrical, the UK's electrical grid, um, for a project of this scale? Can it handle another 25 gigawatts coming in from the north of Scotland? Well, it's not just the GB grid that has to handle it, because um, part of the whole uh, strategy of national grid is to uh, develop interconnectors with uh, neighbouring systems. So there's the um, connection to, um, to Norway, which is 720 kilometres in length. I think that's the world's longest high voltage DC link. Um, there's uh, a link to Denmark, and there's also uh, the, the links on the south coast to France and Belgium. So it's there's a lot of toing and froing of power. The whole principle of the European target model for the electricity market was to enable the interchange of significant quantities of power between um, transmission zones to try and equalise prices across the whole of um, uh, across the whole of Europe. And one of the consequences of Brexit is that the flexibility that was inherent in that design where the um, capacity booked in interconnectors was part of the option process of the, of the power and the, uh, the system calculated what the best flows between different networks would be to give the optimal price. That's gone now. So you have to bid in a different kind of way 
which doesn't have that flexibility, which is more expensive, leads to greater price swings. And so it's a lot to do with the, uh, the market in which the energy is traded, as well as the physical capability of the wires um, to, to transport power. It depends as well. You think that there's uh, an actual finite capacity of, uh, of a cable, uh, but there is a lot to do with your security standard as well. And I'll explain that in a second. And there's also the temperature of the cable. So a cable can carry more power in winter when it's cold mm -hmm. than it will in summer when it's warm. And that's to do with how much it sags and the, um, uh, issues like that. But I, I remember when the miners' strike was happening, the theoretical capacity of the interconnector between Scotland and England was 850 megawatts. But because there were two wires running across the border, they could run that uh, transfer at 1700 megawatts. So power stations were running flat out in Scotland, delivering the power into England, and they reduced the security standard in order to, to make it happen. So the grid is not just a fixed kind of thing. It's very dynamic. It requires a huge amount of skill to operate on a minute by minute basis because demand and uh, production have to match at all times to keep the frequency level. So can the, the grid hold it? Yes, we need more storage. We need uh, mechanisms for producing um, flexibility in both supply and demand. And we need storage and probably a lot of hydrogen as well. But also we need interconnections. One um, very hot energy topic amongst especially uh, Scottish political activists at the moment is the fees that the national grid charges to connect um, electricity generators to that grid. They're known as the tenuous fees. Um, and people in Scot Scottish politi political circles are well aware of the, the very large disparity in the fees that are charged for generators in the south of England compared to the north of Scotland. And of course, the Scotland project is all in the north of Scotland. Um, Ian, can you tell us a bit more about about that? How those charges will affect may affect Scotland, and, and how they might affect the, the the payments coming from it. Well, the current uh, transmission charging system was designed about thirty years ago, and it was designed in an era of gas-fired power stations and coal-fired stations. And there was no thought really about where you locate plant other than that a gas-fired power station should be handy for a gas supply and a coal-fired power station would be uh, best built on top of a coal mine. So the world is very, very different now. Mm. And if I could just quote from Ofgem's consultation, one of the working papers on uh, why interconnections are a good thing, they say, Interconnectors also allow for regional specialization of low carbon development, meaning renewables can be located in areas with highest specific load factors, for example, by placing renewable projects such as solar power in Southern Europe or wind and hydro in the North Sea. So the, um, the regulator recognizes that interconnectors are good because it can transport large amounts of valuable power from where the resource is to where it's needed. But on land in GB, the charging mechanism is based on how far the um, production of power is from where the load is, and therefore the size of cables and the amount of infrastructure that has to be uh, implemented in order to transport the power. And it also is a forward-looking type of mechanism where it says, well, what is the likely investment cost of the next megawatt of capacity to be connected onto the system? So rather than looking at um, transmission charging in the same way as they look at interconnector charging, they look and say, what is the impact on the existing system, which was designed for a previous era? The idea of Tenuous charges is that they will give pricing signals and messages to developers as to where they should site their generation. So clearly you should be building 25 gigawatts of uh, wind farms in Cornwall 
because they're short of generation. And so generation uh, to nurse charges are negative there. But the wind resource in Cornwall is good, but it's not as good as in the North Sea. You can't cover 7,000 um, uh, hectares or acres or whatever the thing is. You can't um, monopolize the area of seabed that would be required for your 25 gigawatts in the main approaches to the English Channel. It's not doable. So your, your transmission charging is giving signals which are completely bonkers. And meanwhile, interconnectors have zero in the way of charges when they land power onto the GB system. So if um, a connection system was to be developed that treated these new 25 gigawatts of capacity as load connected by interconnectors, then their connection charges would be zero. Mm. So if, for example, Scotland had been built in Denmark and it was exporting to the UK, those charges exactly. would be zero. Yes, yes. And I, <laughs> I specifically went and, and looked to see if there had been any changes as a result of Brexit. But the latest information on uh, National Grid's website is still uh, interconnectors of zero to no us charging. I know that this is an issue that has been raised um, by the Scottish government. It's been raised by Scottish politicians in the House of Commons, um, but it's still something that the UK government is uh, refusing to even look at. Uh, never mind uh, the, the the prospect of changes coming from a review. Um, so, again, this is something probably one of the biggest. Uh, um, Levers in favour of independence when it comes to uh, when it comes to developing Scotland's renewable resources as the ability to reform the grid to to take advantage of those resources. Yes, indeed, and um, the original plan for the connection to Norway was that it would land in northeast Scotland, but it's now going to or has gone to Blythe in North East England. So. We're being cut out of the loop. So even um, having an interconnecting system that would allow uh, a, a Scottish system to trade more flexibly with Europe uh, is being cut off from us. Now, one of the the things that again proponents of Scotland have have hailed as part of this project is the the promises of supply chain benefits and jobs and manufacturing in Scotland um, to 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 build and maintain and service this project. Do either of you have any idea of what promises have actually been made so far and, and does the, the, the hype stack up or as with, for example, the, the, the oil sector, do we risk seeing a lot of the benefit of that going elsewhere? Well, the contract states that, as we know, a large amount of that is subject to further negotiations. Um, we are aware that SSE have made some commitments, however legally binding or not they are, I think is open to question. Um, we do not in Scotland have anywhere near the sort of supply chains that we are talking about and we could have done by now. Um, you know, as I said before, it's not like this auction hasn't been planned it's over a decade ago. Um, we have seen the Scottish government do basically nothing, um, in fact, negatively on um, developing a domestic manufacturing base. Um, if you're on Twitter, check out Dick, Winchester, Dick Winchester's tweets. Um, he's on this all the time. He's completely right. Um, he, he actually you know, wrote, a very, he wrote a very good article about exactly this, and I'll link that to the, in the description. Uh, yeah, the I mean, we had the opportunity to buy out Bifab. Bifab's now owned um, by a company that will pay most of us, paying most of its taxes in Canada. Um, the Scottish government had the opportunity to buy out the assets from our power when um, that went under, I think is... The most correct phrase we can use and um, it chose not to there and um, in terms of the public energy company um, the consultation that was done on it or the, the feasibility work that was done considered only a retail energy company model and um, you know as we've said we could have told them that a retail energy model uh, a retail energy company model um, was a complete waste of time you know a non-starter for free you know plenty of other people would have said exactly the same thing um, so why did that work not consider an asset owning company? You know, where, where is the Scottish government putting all this public money? Because it is not coming back into building capacity. 
And even the stuff they're talking about with skills, which is a move in the right direction, is very little, very late. Um, and as far as we can see at the moment, very poorly designed. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the criticisms we actually got to, to our response to this. And it's a fair one to a degree, as it looks like we're almost wishing that we had built the, tr- we'd planted the trees 20 years ago. Um, and we're saying, well, yeah, we, we called for them to be planted and they weren't. And now we're in the situation we're in today and everything has followed through from that. But let's take that and let's imagine in a few years' time, there's going to be Scott Wind 2 or some other auction of Scottish energy resources. What should Scotland be doing now to prepare for that so that we don't make the same mistakes? I think the, um, the thing that should be done immediately is to set up an asset-owning Scottish energy company. We have a perfectly adequate template for that in the 1943 Hydroelectric Development Scotland Act. You could score out hydroelectric and write renewables, and it would serve pretty much as a template for legislation in the here and now. The uh, unique thing about the uh, act setting up the Hydro Board was the social clause, which was, it was explicitly um, mandated to develop the economy of the north of Scotland. We should have an asset owning energy company with a social clause remit, which is to develop the economy of Scotland. Mm. And that would include the things that uh, Keith has, has talked about, about building supply chain, building skills, and doing that through procurement as well as more direct action. Keith, anything to add to that? I was going to say we need to address the question of, who, of how it would be paid for. Um, which I know you've done quite a bit of work on. So I'll throw that one back at you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I'll actually be writing about this in the, the Commonweal uh, news, uh, newsletter this week. So I'll put a subscription link to the newsletter in the description of the podcast. If you want to sign up for that, you will get it in your inbox early on a Thursday morning every week. Um, essentially, we'd be looking at the Scottish National Investment Bank um, and, and what's been going on with that. Um, because it does face the, the, the same kind of borrowing barriers that a lot of other big projects in Scotland face. Uh, and that's that uh, a company fundamentally owned by the Scottish government, if it borrows money, in most cases, that money is that borrowing is counted against the Scottish government's borrowing limits, which are too tight to be used. Um, this is not the case for banks such as NatWest, formerly RBS, owned by the UK government, um, still majority owned by the UK government, who are allowed to keep their borrowing off book. Um, And it doesn't count against the UK's deficit, it doesn't count against the UK's debt. So we are essentially calling for that same treasury dispensation to be given to the National Investment Bank and possibly to the National Energy Company as well if it's set up under a similar regime and allow them to attract investment or borrow money in their own right. And that would make the job a lot easier. Well, interestingly, on the public energy company, as you guys will know, I was in a Scottish government consultation event this morning on uh, the public energy agency. Um, Who thought of the idea of an agency, we wonder? Um, The consultation, um, I will just say, is the worst consultation I've ever seen come out of the Scottish Government, um, which, bearing in mind, they produced the local heat and energy efficiency strategy one and two. So the first one was so bad they had to have a second one. I think it's quite an achievement. Um, and we got told this morning that a public energy company or companies is still potentially on the cards. Um, I do encourage people to go and have a look at the, the public energy agency consultation because, uh, to be honest, they clearly have no idea what they're doing. Um, they haven't actually established whether it will be a government body, an arm's length government body, or any other model. Um, and I won't take too much time on this because I'm sure we'll come back to it in the future. But um, they're really, they, you know, for, considering they're supposed to be saying this will be set up as a virtual agency by September of this year, um, the lack of thinking, um, considering, especially considering, you know, they had some great policy papers that we've produced that they could have gone back and considered. Uh, it's shockingly bad. Um, 
well, I would say bad if there actually was any. Um, but it was made very clear this morning that there's potential for this and there's potential for that. And we might do this and we might do that. But we haven't actually decided a single thing about this agency that we're planning to launch in September. Hmm. And what's the purpose of this agency compared with some of the energy companies? How many? Uh, they're not are? sure. If you look at the consultation document, it's a complete word salad. Um, it talks about all sorts of roles and responsibilities that might be or would potentially be accrued to the agency. Um, that's about it. They are throwing it out as a call for evidence. And to be honest, you know, it, it, people need to realise it takes quite a bit of time to, to respond to consultations. And when they're asking for information, you think, well, that might not even be relevant in you know a month's time. You think, well, if they're not going to put in the effort, why should anybody else put in the effort? And they wonder why they have difficulties with stakeholder engagement. Well, one of the wonderful things about Commonweal is that we do have access to some some of Scotland's top experts in various fields, like uh, our uh, members of the Energy Group, and we're very grateful for, uh, especially for you, Keith, who's been responding to a lot of these consultations, but to the, the wealth of knowledge from Ian and from the other members of the Energy Group who have helped um, helped us keep an eye on what's going on out there and offer our constructive uh, solutions to, to help make things better, not just in energy, but our experts in other groups like social care and whatever other working groups will be forming over the course of this year. Um, so thank you, Keith and Ian, for coming on to the podcast. It's been a fascinating chat uh, with both of you. And I'd just like to finish, uh, as I always do, by saying to all of our listeners that Commonweal, as an organisation, we are entire entirely reliant on our supporters to to produce the the work that we do uh, we don't get government money we don't have corporate sponsors not even the big oil companies um, we don't even have adverts on our website so if any of you out there can uh, help support us in the development of our policy and our um, activist engagement then there is a donate button in the description of this podcast and we are very grateful for any of you who can help with our ongoing activism and with that, thank you once again for joining us on the Commonweal Policy Podcast, and I'll speak to you all next week. Bye.